Well, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, today's webinar on blood culture and the impact of uh, pre-analytics and challenges faced by nursing. Uh, my name is Stéphane Beauchamp. I'm a medical affairs uh, manager with Integrated Diagnostic Solutions uh, here at BD Canada. Uh, and I will be your moderator for uh, today's event. Um, so today's educational web seminar is presented by Lab Roots and brought to you by BD. Um, so we uh, encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have uh, during the presentation. So to do so, just simply type them into the um, ask a question box and don't forget to click send um, and we'll answer as many questions as we have um, time to um, uh, time for at the end of the, uh, the the presentation so you may also submit any technical issues uh, here uh, as well if you have trouble uh, seeing or hearing the, the presentations someone will uh, help you um, to fix that um, so now I'd like to uh, welcome our speakers today. So our first speaker is Dr. Patrick Murray, who was the former uh, Vice President Worldwide Microbiology for BD Life Sciences. Um, Dr. Murray received his uh, doctorate degree in microbiology at UCLA and uh, postgraduate training in clinical microbiology at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, uh, Minnesota. He was director of the clinical microbiology laboratories at Barnes Jewish Hospital and uh, professor of medicine and pathology at Washington University from 1976 to 1999. In 1999, Dr. Murray joined the, the faculty of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And in 2001, he accepted the position of senior scientist and chief of microbiology at the National Institute of Health. In 2011, he retired from the National Institute and accepted his position at BD uh, until he retired in 2022. Uh, Dr. Murray is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and the Infectious Disease Society of America. He was a former chairman of the American Board of Medical Microbiology, editor-in-chief of the Manual of Clinical Microbiology, and editor of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. Uh, Dr. Murray has authored more than 300 research articles and 21 books. Our second speaker is Sarah Smees, who has several years of nursing experience with a sp uh, specialization in vascular access. She is a registered nurse and holds a master's uh, in nursing education. Uh, her nursing career includes experience in oncology, infusion therapy, uh, home care, vascular access, education, teaching, uh, mentorship, and leadership roles in Ontario, California, and Washington, uh, Washington State. She is a member of the INS, the uh, Association of Vascular Access, uh, as well as the SIVA Association. Uh, she is an oncology certified nurse and is certified with National Vascular Access Associations in both Canada and the United States. Sarah is well versed with vascular access products and the patient uh, experience related to their use and practice. She has provided training and support for clinicians uh, throughout her career and she is eager to facilitate uh, others uh, in their learning while focusing on quality uh, patient care and positive outcomes. Evidence informed practice uh, drives her to assist others with the improvement of practice and safety and the development of efficient workflow in a complex healthcare uh, environment. So now, without uh, further ado, I will leave the floor to Dr. Murray for his presentation. Thank you, Stefan, for your, your introduction. And uh, I want to thank BD for the opportunity to speak to this group today. Um, I, as, as Stefan said, I retired at the beginning of this year, so I'm always pleased that BD remembers who I am and invites me back uh, for opportunity to speak to various groups. Today, I'm going to talk about sepsis and specifically diagnostic challenges that we're confronted with with sepsis. Now, I think it's important, maybe this is sort of the educator in me, to start off with definitions so that we're all on the same page um, 
we, we're all talking about the same thing or thinking about the same things. So a bloodstream infection is when you have a positive blood culture in a patient with systemic signs of infection. Uh, and thus infection may be either primary, that is originating in the bloodstream, or it may be secondary originating from a distant organ like the lungs or the urinary tract. When we talk about sepsis, it's the next stage in a bloodstream infection, and that is when we have a life-threatening organ dysfunction that's caused by dysregulated host response to infection. Maybe a little bit more clearly to say is if the body overreacts to an infection, it could damage an organ, and that leads to sepsis as we know it. And septic shock is a more advanced stage of this, where multiple organs are affected um, primarily because the blood pressure is reduced, the patient is in shock, and we have inadequate perfusion of blood and oxygen to the various organs. Obviously, a septic shock condition is the most serious of what we're dealing with. And I think it's also important to think about a few statistics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, in the data that I'm showing in this slide, this originated from data that was collected for the year 2017. And what they estimated globally, there was almost 50 million cases of sepsis that occurred every year. And those resulted in approximately 11 million deaths, or 20% of all deaths that were reported. Sepsis is the leading cause of mortality and critical illness worldwide with hospital mortality rates roughly in the range of 25 to 30 percent. And obviously, there are risk factors that impact on that death rate, such as increasing age, immune dysfunction, delays in the receipt of appropriate antimicrobials, and the organs that are injured during septic shock. Clinical studies have demonstrated also there's a twofold increase in mortality when sepsis is caused, in, when sepsis is managed with inappropriate antimicrobial therapy. And this really underscores the importance of diagnostics to be able to make a very specific diagnosis of what organism is responsible for sepsis and what antibiotics that organism is susceptible to. Otherwise, we treat the patient empirically and the risk of inappropriate antimicrobial therapy is significant. And if we put a cost figure on this, if we look in the United States, it's estimated that septic patients and hospitalization of those septic patients cost more than $24 billion each year. So as the rate of sepsis increase, the cost of sepsis increases, it has a dramatic impact on the hospital system. If we look closer to home in Canada, it was estimated that there are approximately 100,000 cases of sepsis each year. 16,000 patients died each year from sepsis, and the cost is between $42,000 and $66,000 for each septic patient. So as we look both in regionally as well as globally, sepsis is common, sepsis is deadly, and sepsis is very expensive. Now, as we think about the septic sepsis guidelines or the management of septic patients that were published last year, key components are the early identification of a patient with suspected sepsis, to measure lactate and other parameters that can assess the, uh, the risk of sepsis in these patients, to perform cultures, and I, I emphasize cultures here because this diagnostic test is the most specific one for predicting what organism is responsible for sepsis and what antibiotics can be used for treatment. The use of antibiotics and fluids should be initiated early in the course in order to maximize our success and being able to manage these patients. Now, what I want to do is quote, and I don't usually read quotations, but I'm going to do it for this one slide. 
the 2021 sepsis guidelines, and I'm doing this because they make a very important point. They differentiate the patient's clinical condition and say, based on the patient's clinical condition, that should dictate when we start antimicrobials. So we recommend appropriate routine microbiologic cultures, including blood cultures, should be obtained before starting antimicrobial therapy in patients with suspected sepsis and septic shock. But it's very important here. If it results in no substantial delay in the start of antimicrobials. So we for the patients that are clearly septic or in septic shock, the most important thing we do is start the antimicrobials. Now in 28 to 63% of patients, they receive antibiotics prior to culture. And I'll show you in the next slide the impact of that. The microbiologic cultures must be weighed against mortality risk for uh, the mortality risk of delayed key therapy in these patients. Now, if we look at the impact of antibiotics on positive cultures, I think this is a very important slide. This was a study that was done a couple of years ago and they collected almost 1,500 blood cultures. And they looked at the percent of those blood cultures that were positive, and they looked also at when the patients were started on antibiotics. The patients that were started on antibiotics before the blood cultures were collected had a 50% reduction in positive blood cultures. So if you look at the first bars, anywhere from minus six up to one hour after antibiotics were started, we have roughly a 25 to 30% positive blood cultures. But after antibiotics were started for more than one hour, we see a significant reduction in positive blood cultures. And this emphasizes the fact that when we collect a blood culture, it becomes really important to try to do that before the antibiotics are started. And again, now if a patient's in sepsis or septic shock, then we may not be able to do that. But we also then should keep in mind, what does a negative blood culture mean in a patient where the blood cultures were collected after antibiotics were started? If we look again now at, this, at the surviving sepsis guidelines, uh, what was specifically recommended for adults with possible septic shock or high likelihood of sepsis, we recommend administering antimicrobials immediately and ideally within one hour of recognition. So they want to start the antibiotics very rapidly. For patients with possible sepsis without shock, we recommend a rapid assessment of the likelihood of infectious versus non-infectious causes of the acute illness and a time-limited course of rapid investigation and if specific concern for infection persists, the administration of antimicrobials within three hours from the time when sepsis was first recognized. And then finally, with adults with a low likelihood of infection and without shock, we suggest deferring antimicrobials while continuing to closely monitor the patient. So again, using the clinical condition of the patient to decide when you start antimicrobials becomes very important. And for all of these patients, if infection is suspected, to try to collect the cultures as quickly as possible. Now, let me pose a couple of questions. What are the most common sources of sepsis? What microbiologic specimens have the highest diagnostic yield? And what are the challenges in collecting the microbiology specimens? Now, sepsis can be caused by infections with bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. So all infectious organisms can cause sepsis. 
Infections associated with sepsis include the urinary tract, lower respiratory tract, meningitis, intra-abdominal infections, skin and soft tissue infections, and intravascular or catheter-related infections. Now, if you think about it, most of our cultures are geared to detect bacteria and geared to detect yeast. So filamentous fungi, viruses, and parasites are likely not going to be detected by our conventional cultures. And so as we think about positive cultures, it's important to keep that in mind. And again, let me illustrate that a little bit. It's not uncommon to hear the comments that blood cultures are frequently negative in my septic patient. And data that's been collected would say that can be anywhere from 20 to 48% of the blood cultures will be positive. So as much as 80% of the blood cultures are negative. I already illustrated in the earlier slide that the effect of antibiotics can directly reduce the number of positive blood cultures. But we also have to think about other things like viruses. So as an example, we've, we're in... Well, I'm not sure if I'd say in the midst of the COVID pandemic, hopefully we're getting beyond that. It's becoming um, something that we've, we're learning to live with. But we saw with COVID, that virus can cause sepsis. And so, again, you have to keep in mind, not all causes of sepsis are what we can culture with routine blood cultures. I think it's also important to think about we can get other positive blood cultures that can help with the diagnosis, whether that's from a urine culture, a respiratory culture, or whatever. But there will still be a certain proportion of cultures that are negative. And as we face a diagnostic challenge, what we want to say is that for the organisms responsible for sepsis that we should be able to culture, let's maximize our ability to do that. So let's talk about this just a little bit. Um, if we look at different types of specimens that can be collected, the urinary tract uh, specimens um, are become very, are very important. In a septic patient, you what a physician routinely will do would be to collect blood cultures, but also respiratory cultures, urine cultures, and other specimens where where infections are suspected. In urinary tract there usually is a low urine flow rate in septic patients. So that becomes a challenge. In addition, the number of organisms per milliliter of urine is affected by the type of pathogen, the time of day that it's collected, the frequency that the patient has been voiding, whether the patient is hydrated or not, and prior antimicrobial therapy. And it's those various factors that have really underscored the, the observation that more than half of patients with urinary tract infections have less than 10 to the 5 organisms per milliliter of urine. So in many cases with a urinary tract infection, particularly a septic patient, there may be small numbers of organisms that are actually present in the specimen that's collected. And also for urinary tract infection, we want to avoid contamination with urethrobacteria. For lower respiratory tract infections, we have to think about fastidious organisms that may not be recovered in blood cultures, viral pathogens, and then contamination with oral secretions. For meningitis, this is an invasive collection, so it's more difficult. Prior exposure to antibiotics can reduce the value of culture. And if the infection is caused by viruses or fungi like cryptococcus, the cultures are typically negative. Intra-abdominal infections are an invasive collection with a mixture of organisms. And the same is true for skin and soft tissue infections. For an intravascular infection, many pathogens will not be recovered in the blood culture, as I've already mentioned. Care has to be used to avoid contamination. The majority of bacterial infections have small numbers of organisms present. I'll share some data on that. Positive blood cultures 
uh, are really related to the types of media that we use, much so, mo more so than what instrument the cultures are incubated in. And finally, the presence of antibiotics reduce the culture yield. So as we think about blood cultures, and that's going to be my focus now for the remainder of this presentation, there are two factors, two variables that are most important. One is the volume of blood that's collected, and the second is the culture media that's used. If we think about optimizing our blood cultures in the pre-analytical phase, there's some important points that are important to keep in mind. Most septic patients have less than one organism per milliliter of blood. On the average, most blood culture bottles are filled with less than 25% of the recommended volume of blood. Numerous clinical studies have demonstrated that if the bottles were properly filled, the proportion of positive blood cultures would be increased by almost 50%. And finally, clinical studies have demonstrated that two to three blood cultures, each consisting of two bottles, would give us an optimum yield for those blood cultures. Now, let me share a little bit of statistics, a little bit of data that supports each of these. The first is the quantitation of bacteremia and fungemia. And I've quoted here five studies. Um, there are numerous studies that show the same thing, but I just want to emphasize uh, w one very important point. If we look at the last column, and I have a list of different organisms, Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas yeast, and so forth. In the, in the vast, how do I phrase this? And a large proportion of these bacteremias, there is less than one organism present, anywhere from about 25% to over 70% of the cultures had fewer than one organism per milliliter of uh, blood. And that makes sense because if most infections are coming from a distant site, let's say the lungs, when those organisms spill into the bloodstream, they're getting diluted you also have phagocytic cells that are removing those organisms. So when you draw a blood culture from a peripheral vein, you're going to have relatively few organisms in that sample when it's collected. The next point is that for most blood culture bottles, they're underfilled. And again, I have uh, seven studies that I've quoted here and they look at the percent of bottles that were properly filled, and we see anywhere from 3% of the bottles were properly filled to less than 50% of the bottles. And this is true whether it's a pediatric or an adult patient. Two nice studies by, by Chang and Kahari uh, looked at the actual average amount of blood put into a bottle, and it was right around two and a half milliliters of blood which is one quarter of the amount of blood that should be processed or that what's recommended. There's a number of studies that have looked at what happens when you increase the volume of blood that's cultured. And in every case, as you increase the amount of blood you culture, you get more positive blood cultures. The last study by Patel maybe is the uh, best one to look at. And what they did is they filled uh, between four and six bottles, each bottle with 10 milliliters of blood. And they then said, okay, if we look at one bottle compared to two bottles, what is the increase in positives? And that they saw a 25% increase in positive blood cultures by using two bottles properly filled. By using four bottles properly filled, there was almost a 50% increase. And using six bottles or three blood cultures, they had almost a 65% increase in positive cultures. So with all of this in mind, it's important to remember, relatively few organisms circulate in the blood of patients with infections. So we need to collect a large volume of blood in order to maximize the number of positive cultures. Blood culture bottles are consistently underfilled. So many cultures are gonna be negative. So we should maximize the value of blood cultures by following a simple rule. 10 milliliters of blood per bottle, two bottles per culture, 
and a minimum of two cultures per patient. And with that, we should see a more than 50% increase in our positive blood cultures. And ultimately, isn't that why we collect blood cultures? The other factor to keep in mind is the culture media. And again, a couple of principles are important to keep in mind here. There's no culture medium that will support the growth of all organisms. Resin media will remove both antibiotics, but also important growth nutrients. So we have to balance the value of resin media. Specialized media like pediatric fungal and lytic media enhance the recovery and time to detection of selected pathogens. And we always have to use a combination of aerobic and anaerobic uh, media. When I say no culture media supports the growth of all organisms, just think about the simple fact that strict aerobic organisms like Pseudomonas and yeast don't grow in the anaerobic bottle and strict anaerobic organisms like Bacteroides don't grow in the aerobic bottle. We need a combination of media types to enhance the overall recovery of organisms. Resin media was introduced 40 years ago by Becton Dickinson, and it was introduced to remove antibiotics present in the blood sample. Um, most antibiotic classes can be removed by uh, these resins, although some extended spectrum cephalosporins, carbapenems, and other broad spectrum antibiotics can still have activity that remains. But resins also remove nutrients, anticoagulants, and other required growth factors. So when we think about a resin media, it's important to remember there's a balance between their beneficial effects and their harmful effects. So to say we have the most powerful resin media is not necessarily the best media because it could be removing more nutrients than, um, than, than a more balanced resin media. And with 40 years of experience, Becton Dickinson had with preparing resin media, uh, I think they've done a very good job balancing the benefits and the deficits of these, uh, these types of media formulations. Specialized media is also important. That includes pediatric media that's specifically designed for pediatric patients, specialized fungal media that enhances the both detection and time to detection of slow-growing fungi like Candida glabrata and Cryptococcus neoformans. Lytic media releases intracellular organisms and the lice blood cells provide nutrients that enhance the rate of growth of organisms, which and with the elimination of blood cells, it reduces the background of uh, blood cell metabolism. So we see earlier detection of organisms in specific lytic media. And then finally, there's a number of studies that have shown the value of anaerobic media with improved recovery when an anaerobic bottle is combined with an aerobic bottle. And this is primarily because the majority of organisms that we detect in blood cultures are facultative anaerobic organisms. That is organisms that grow both aerobically and anaerobically. Organisms like the staphylococci, the streptococci, the intrabacteriaceae. And we see that many of those organisms initially prefer to grow in the anaerobic bottle, which is the reason why the anaerobic bottle is, is combined with the aerobic bottle. So the principles of positive blood cultures, relatively few organisms circulate in the bloodstream of the septic patient. Culture and increased volume of blood increases the likelihood of obtaining a positive blood culture and the use of multiple types of media is required for an optimum blood culture. So an important question remains, how do we optimize blood collection? Um, you have to use the fastest, most effective skin disinfectants. In the table here, I, I have data on both tincture of iodine and chlorhexidine alcohol, both of which are excellent disinfectants for blood cultures. The difference though is chlorhexidine's activity is faster and it appears to be a bit more effective with tincture of iodine. 
We should also consider the use of standardized collection protocols as well as collection kits to standardize the way blood cultures are collected to get the optimum results. Where possible, a dedicated phlebotomy team should be used and critical for however blood cultures are, are collected, whatever team is collecting blood cultures, is we have to provide education, we have to provide training, we have to monitor the effectiveness of this education and training and give feedback how to improve our blood culture techniques. We should also look for sort of innovative approaches to doing the standardized procedure. And I just illustrate that concept with needle design. Um, in the um, BD Ultra Touch is a thin wall needle that allows, to, allows you to collect blood at a fader, faster rate uh, than a traditional needle. And so just a little bit of uh, calculations using a thin wall needle, which then has a larger interior diameter. For a 23 gauge needle, that provides a 40% increase opening size. And for a 25 gauge needle, it's a 33% uh, increase uh, opening size. For the 23 gauge needle using the uh, ultra touch needle, at least with laboratory bench studies, they've shown that there's an 86% increased rate of collecting blood. And so ultimately what you wanna do is maximize the amount of blood that goes into the blood culture bottle. And to do that, is to allow faster flow rate into that bottle. So let me just summarize um, what, what I've, the points I've tried to make here. Um, we recognize that each clinical situation poses a diagnostic and an economic challenge. Each patient in each hospital setting is going to be different. And this can limit, this can limit the availability of diagnostics. So what I would say is the collection of a single properly filled two bottle blood culture is better than collection of multiple poor quality cultures. So my, my plea is to make every blood culture that's collected optimal. And if that means you can only collect one culture set, all right, maximize the value of that one culture set. If you can collect two to three blood culture sets, maximize the value of each one that's collected. So with that, let me stop here uh, and let me turn the, um, the platform over to Sarah Smees. And um, I have a message here I'm just trying to see. Okay, so Sarah, I'll let you take over. Wonderful, well, thank you, Dr. Murray. That was excellent. Hi everyone, and thank you for your time today. My name is Sarah, and I'm a vascular access nurse here in Canada, with experience both in Canada and the US. So very excited to be here today to participate in this important webinar. As Dr. Murray explained, there are many ways in which pre-analytics can impact the quality of a blood culture sample. And our lab teams and nurses do a great job taking into consideration the topics discussed previously when it comes to venipuncture collection. However, specific to nursing, there are some differences, especially when accessing central lines, which is unique to us as nurses. So we know that 70% of all clinical decisions are based on laboratory test results. And this is more critical for patients with a suspected bloodstream infection who are at risk for sepsis. However, we recognize that it is hard to maintain competencies with staffing shortages, which all healthcare facilities are currently experiencing, which means you may have less capacity for training or making sure nurses are following standard operating procedures and protocols. Blood culture collection may not be top of mind for your nurses, depending on the institution, they're sometimes trained and coached by more experienced peers However, training can vary with each nurse trainer based on their skills and preferences. 
Peer coaches also have their own patience and responsibilities, so training may be cut short or only cover the basics. Now, Dr. Murray did an excellent job discussing the challenges of blood culture collection, the impact of the pre-analytics on the quality of the blood culture results, and many of our institutions have phlebotomy teams who are experts in venipuncture blood culture collections. From a nursing perspective, what happens if a blood culture collection from a central venous access device is required? This is something that is unique to nursing as phlebotomists are not permitted to touch these lines. And yet if a clabsy is suspected, we need to rule out an infection. And so this practice is what I want to review with you all today. Carefully analyze the risks versus benefits before deciding to use a central vascular access device for obtaining blood samples. Risks associated with sampling from a CVAD include increased hub manipulation, the potential for intraluminal contamination, as well as alterations in device patency. The Infusion Nursing Society, or INS, standards state that Collection from CVADs should only be performed to rule out central line associated bloodstream infections or in the absence of viable peripheral venipuncture sites. All other blood culture collections should be performed via venipuncture. So first point, as referenced earlier, the needleless connector on the line has been proven to be a high source of contamination. So even if the connector was just changed a few hours ago, please replace the needleless connector with a brand new sterile connector. In addition, you may think that because it's brand new, you don't have to disinfect it. However, let's say your gloves have touched the needleless connector during the change. This may potentially contaminate the sample. So after the new needleless connector has been replaced, disinfect according to your facility's policy. Secondly, do not discard blood prior to the blood culture draw if a clabsy is suspected. Discarding the initial blood draw would mean losing the blood which has been sitting in the catheter, which is most likely con to contain pathogens. And finally, never directly connect the culture bottle to the line due to the serious risk of a reflux of catheter broth or medium into the catheter. This is actually the rationale behind the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, directive against direct connection for phlebotomy blood cultures. Therefore, a syringe collection is recommended for taking cultures from a PIC or other central line. At least two blood culture sets should be obtained from a patient with a suspected catheter-related bloodstream infection. At least one set should be obtained from a peripheral vena puncture and labeled as such. At approximately the same time the peripheral set is obtained, the other set should be obtained aseptically from the catheter hub or through the venous access port septum and labeled as such. And the last point I want to highlight about blood collection through a central line focuses on safety. I've seen this many times and even done this myself by attaching a lure lock syringe to the line, drawing the necessary amount of blood, and then found a way to transfer the blood either into the blood culture bottles or into blood tubes using a needle. Using a needle for this is not safe practice. I think we all understand this as there is a risk for needle stick injury, which is why the INS standard states Using a needleless transfer device, fill the appropriate vacuum tubes or blood culture bottles with the designated volume of blood in the correct sequence. BD's back tech or skinny neck bottles fit inside BD's blood transfer device as seen on the image in the slide. Other bottles may be too wide to fit. It will be necessary to pursue the need for a safe transfer device with those manufacturers. According to INS, the use of vacuum tubes or holders may not be recommended for use on smaller CVADs. For example, a 1.9 French or 2.6 French peripherally inserted central catheter. 
The entire blood spectrum collection process includes multiple steps. For this training, we will review the following four steps, which are preparation, collection, material disposal, and lastly, labeling and transport of the specimens. Remember to always follow your institution's current policies and procedures. Identify the correct patient with the order for blood culture specimen collection at the time of sample collection and in the presence of the patient. Use two different unique identifiers as directed by your policy and procedure to ensure the correct patient is having their blood drawn. This is vitally important to ensure the correct blood culture results align with the correct patient. Do not rely on room and bed location for patient identification as patients may be moved frequently in the acute care setting. Provide patient education regarding the purpose and process for blood sampling. Stop all infusions as appropriate at least one minute prior to the blood collection. If you are using a staggered multi-lumen CVAD, withdraw blood from the most distal lumen. Always use the appropriate lumen as recommended by the catheter manufacturer. Looking at bottle preparation before use, ensure each blood culture bottle is free from any sign of contamination, such as cloudiness, bulging, or depressed septum or leakage. Keep in mind optimal fill levels for BD Bactec bottles are 8 to 10 mils for adults and one to three mils for pediatrics. So before collecting your bottles, using the measurement guide on the side of the BD Bactec bottle, mark the bottle with the desired fill level. A dark pen or Sharpie works well. This way, when you are in the process of transferring the blood into the bottle, you know when you have reached the optimal fill level. The use of a 10 mil syringe will also help ensure that you've collected the correct quantity of blood from the line. Since blood collection is the primary reason for this practice, follow universal precautions and wear gloves. I have seen many nurses neglect to do this, which increases their risk for blood exposure. Remove the flip off, off cap from the bottle tops and disinfect the rubber septum with alcohol. This step will prevent contaminants from entering the bottle during collection. Caution here on not using povidone iodine since it corrodes the septum. Finally, allow the alcohol to fully dry before puncturing the septum once collection has been initiated. Next, as discussed earlier, you will remove and discard the used needleless connector prior to drawing a blood sample. To do this, first disinfect the connection surface and sides of the existing needle-free connector and the catheter hub for five to 15 seconds with isopropyl alcohol or for chlorhexidine gluconate according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. Remove the connector and clean the outside of the catheter hub using the same process. Be sure to let it dry. If it is not dry when the new sterile connector is applied, it may bond the connector to the catheter hub, making it more difficult to remove. Dry times are five seconds for isopropyl alcohol and 20 seconds for chlorhexidine gluconate on a device. Apply a new sterile needleless connector and disinfect according to your facility's internal protocol and allow to fully dry. Now on to the actual blood collection. Using a sterile 10 mil syringe, attach the lure lock syringe to the line using aseptic technique and collect eight to 10 mils of blood for each bottle and one to three mils for pediatric bottles. For pediatric collections, also ensure you refer to your internal protocol as the required volume collected may be based on patient body weight. Once you have drawn the correct Amount of blood, disconnect from the line and insert the syringe tip into the BD Vacutainer blood transfer device and turn clockwise to secure. Place the blood transfer device with the syringe attached over the top of the blood culture vial and puncture septum to allow blood to transfer into the aerobic vial. This process ensures that you are safely transferring the blood into the blood culture bottle with no risk of needle stick injury. Bottles should be inverted gently several times to prevent clotting. 
Repeat these collection steps with a new sterile syringe and blood transfer device and transfer the collected sample to the anaerobic vial, ensuring no air bubbles enter vial. If other blood work needs to be drawn, in addition to cultures, obtain blood samples using the appropriate order of draw to prevent carryover of additives between collection tubes. Most importantly, blood culture bottles should always be collected first. Finally, flush the CVAD according to internal protocol. Using a pulsatile push-pause technique minimizes buildup of residue from medications or fibrin. This technique creates a turbulent flush that helps clear the sides as well as the center of the catheter. Ensuring the line is free of blood following specimen collection is critical to ensure the catheter remains patent for future use and reduces the risk of occlusion-related complications. Once collection is complete, dispose of the syringes and blood transfer devices in the nearest sharps container. Dispose of all used materials, such as gloves, appropriately and wash hands. Label appropriately with required information, including the date and time of collection, specific central venous access device used for collection, and volume of blood collected immediately after the phlebotomy and in the patient's presence. Be cautious not to cover the barcode with stickers or writing as it is used by the instrument to process the specimen. Also, do not cover the bottom of the bottle as it is monitored for microorganism growth. Follow your policy and procedure for documentation, but typical information included in the patient's health record includes the date and the time of the phlebotomy, the route and specific VAD or lumen used, the amount of blood withdrawn and specific laboratory tests, um, VAD flushing and locking, patient response to the procedure, as well as the education that you provided to the patient. Lastly, <clears throat> transport bottles to the lab in a closed, leak-proof biohazard container as soon as possible. Any delays in entering blood culture bottles into the continuous monitoring blood culture instruments may delay or impede detection of growth. Remember that blood culture bottles should never be refrigerated or frozen after collection as this can kill the microorganisms. I hope this presentation has informed your practice in a meaningful way and perhaps clarified questions you may have had regarding blood culture collection from a nursing perspective. Thank you for your time and for any additional information or to learn more about BD's clinical and educational services, please contact your local BD representative. And I'll hand it back over. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Murray, and thank you, Sarah, for your uh, informative, informative presentations. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions. So if you have any question you'd like to ask, please uh, do so now. As I mentioned earlier, you just uh, click on the ask uh, a question box located on the far left of your screen and we will uh, answer them. Um, so let's see. So we have a few questions here. So the first question is for Dr. Murray. Um, so for venipuncture collections, can the type of wing set selected have an impact on field volumes? So I think it's important to um, go, go back to one of the comments I made right at the end of my presentation, and that is, the um, fill volume is going to be uh, in large part determined by how long the, the venipuncture collection kit is in contact with the bottle itself. And so uh, needle design where the inner lumen is larger than a conventional needle uh, is going to allow a faster fill per unit of time. And so, yes, it does make a difference what type of a wing set is used. And 
And that was really the reason why BD developed the UltraTouch uh, needle design for, um, for collection of blood. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, another one for Dr. Murray. So you mentioned um, specialized media uh, earlier in your presentation. So are all blood culture uh, vendors, medias equivalent, especially uh, for pediatric um, media? You know, each, each company's media is um, proprietary. And the design of the media is what they think is going to be optimum for recovery of organisms. Um, I think it's very important to look at the formulations of media. And in some cases, it's revealing. You specifically mentioned, or the, the person who posed the question specifically mentioned pediatric media. Um, I think it's important to, to remember that um, just because a small volume of media is put into a bottle and called pediatric does not mean it's specifically designed for pediatric patients. Um, so the, at least to my knowledge now, and this may have changed, but I don't think it has, um, the BU Mary U pediatric media is the same media that's used in adult uh, bottles, just with a smaller volume. Uh, when Beck and Dickinson developed their pediatric media, it was with uh, pediatric patients specifically in mind, particularly organisms like Haemophilus, to optimize the recovery of, of those types of organisms. Um, I think uh, the same thing could be said about fungal media that, that's, um, uh, that's available. Again, specific formulations that are designed to optimize recovery of fungi. Uh, I believe BD is the only company that has lytic media, which I actually think it's the best media that's currently available in the market. And then finally, the resin media, uh, both Bu Mary U and Beckton Dickinson make that. They use different concentrations of resins in their bottles and different media formulations of supplements for those bottles. So again, there are differences there. And in the case of resins media, I, I would again emphasize um, you have to look at the overall recovery of organisms in those bottles and not just say which bottle is the most effective in removing antibiotics because the most powerful resins for removing antibiotics aren't necessarily the best for a blood culture bottle. So there are differences. Thank you. Um, now one question for uh, Sarah. So uh, our facility uses non-BD bottles. And so when transferring line collections with a syringe, we currently use the blunt fill needle uh, you showed during your, your presentation, which is certainly risky practice. Uh, have you found a blood transfer device that fits um, the wider non-BD bottles? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I am most familiar with the BD products and the BD um, Backtech bottles, as well as that transfer device. So I'm not aware, but I would really check with that manufacturer and see if they have a safe alternative to using a needle for that transfer practice. Um, I mean, that being said, I know with, with BD, we have everything, the, the full solution um, for blood collection, blood culture results um, from the transfer device as well as the instrument all the way to the patient result. So it's got that full spectrum and that's that's my knowledge. So I would say I would just really focus on, on transferring with a, a transfer device instead of using that needle in a potentially unsafe way. Excellent, thank you. Um, let me check here. So we have a comment here about, uh, saying thank you, Dr. Marie and Sarah, for this excellent uh, presentation. Um, and they were asking if we can share uh, the presentations um, with the staff. So just so you know, for your information, um, this um, presentation will be available on this site uh, for one year. Um, 
and you feel free to connect, con uh, contact your BD representative uh, as they will also be able to uh, support your hospital with uh, further education uh, as well for your nursing staff uh, or your lab staff. Um, so with the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna wrap this up. So um, on behalf of BD, Thank you again, Dr. Murray and Sarah for your time today and your important work. Um, we would also uh, like to thank LabRoots for organizing today's educational um, uh, webcast. So before we go, I'd, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining uh, us today and for their interesting questions. Uh, so questions we did not have time for today and those submitted uh, during the on-demand period. Uh, will be addressed by uh, the speaker, uh, the speakers via the, the um, contact information um, you provided at the time of registration. So I'm, I'm seeing a couple of questions coming in um, still. So those questions will be uh, addressed and uh, answered. Don't worry about that. So this webcast can be viewed on demand. So LabRoots will uh, alert you uh, via email uh, when it's available for replay. So we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues um, who may have missed uh, today's live event. So again, on behalf of BD, thank you uh, for attending. Um, so take care everyone and uh, goodbye. <laughs>